are we get <clears throat> Welcome, my name is Lorraine Ronke, and I am your moderator for today, and that is quite enough about me, because we have far more interesting people here to introduce the context and the background of our event, which is from commitment to action. How can existing initiatives and tools help advance the COP28 food system transformation agenda? So welcome everyone. To start us off on what we can do what we can do about moving food system transformation. I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Ismahan Alwafi, CGIR's new Executive Managing Director. She has come to the CG directly from the FAO where she was Chief Scientist. Ismahan, welcome. Thank you very much, Lorraine, and ladies and gentlemen, really a pleasure to be with you here. Uh, what I maybe want to stand with it, start with is really to say that the word simply cannot meet its climate or development goal without transforming agri-food systems. So we all agree that really agri-food system, it's central and front as we talk about adapting ourselves to the climate of tomorrow and ending hunger by doing so. So the food and agriculture sector can and must reduce its emission while equipping farmers to cope with climate extreme. The good news is that we have proven solutions and technologies that can allow us to do so. But getting those solutions into the hand of farmers, in the hand of consumers and policymakers remain a key challenge. That is why the breakthrough agenda led by UK and Egypt is such a vital international effort. It focuses attention and efforts on deploying and accelerating practical proven solutions to climate change. The goal of agriculture for agriculture within the Breakthrough Agenda is to make climate resilience, sustainable agriculture, the most attractive and the widely adopted agri-food system and options that farmers will go to everywhere by 2030. And CGR is really honored that we had the pen on putting together this agriculture chapter. Now, priority action have been identified that will support the goals of the Breakthrough Agenda. From our perspective, there are three priority actions that we need all to work on to move forward this agriculture breakthrough to really get us to the impact that we all strive for. The first one is increased finance that must be direct to support both the research and the deployment of proven agriculture technologies. The CERES 2030 report identifies the need to double investment in agriculture R&D to help hunger, double smallholder farmers' income, and protect the climate. Uh, and we heard numbers over the last week, whereby we heard that agriculture is getting 4% only of the climate finance. We heard that 0.3% of all finance that we get in international development goes to the farmers. Those numbers are very, very worrying, and we need really completely to change and focus on agri-food system and focus on farmers as we are talking about agri-food system. The second priority, it's knowledge. Knowledge must be shared efficiently to support faster and more effective uptake of innovation. And this includes sharing learnings on policy and implementation, which can, be facilitate, which can facilitate faster uptake of proven technologies. So I talk about finance, I talked about sharing knowledge between us and between different stakeholders. And finally, what we need is uniform metrics 
and indicators that we need to develop all of us in a partnership mode. These common metrics will help us to track the adoption and impact of key sustainable agriculture solution around the world. It is welcome news that here at COP28, we had 17 countries that have signed and adopt this recommendation. This demonstrates, demonstrates that the breakthrough agenda can be a powerful policy mechanism to drive sustainable food system transformation. But if we are to achieve the 2030 goal, many more countries should and must join this vital effort. CGR is fully committed to supporting the acceleration and deployment of proven solution, standing at the forefront of agriculture research and innovation over more than 50 years, CGR can support in scaling up existing proven solution. Our work complements many of the key technology focus areas of the agriculture breakthrough, and they're gonna give you some of the examples that focuses on emission reducing and genetic technologies in agriculture. For example, CGR Center Ellery International Livestock Research Institute and its Mazinga Center are leading the way in research and solution to reduce the livestock sector methane emission. And we have some work on forages that can reduce that emission by 30%. CGR Gene Bank are conserving vast quantities of plant genetic resource needed to develop the climate adapted crops to support resilient food system. Another center, International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT, is also optimizing green manure crops, which can better support soil fertility and reduce the need for nitrogen fertilizers. As we look to implement and achieve agriculture breakthrough, political action must be coupled with increased financing for agri-food systems. The world is still under-investing in the solution we need to meet the SDGs, and our shared climate target. CGR, we launched our investment case at COP28 as the start of the campaign to raise $4 billion for our research portfolio 2025 to 2027. With the commitment and with science, we can transform agri-food system from being a source of emission to be a sink for all gases, particularly carbon, from fueling environmental degradation to supporting regeneration and from reducing biodiversity to protecting it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for kicking us off with that context. You know, in addition to the underlying urgency that you spoke of, you also spoke of the, the importance of international collaboration. So to speak to us on some key approaches to fostering those international collaborative actions, I'm very happy to introduce the, the Right Honorable Andrew Mitchell, Member of Parliament and Minister of State for the Development in Africa from the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom. Minister Mitchell. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, very much indeed. I am the British uh, Development Minister, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here with CGIAR, a body we very strongly support and respect. Um, and I'd like to thank them for hosting this event uh, as well. I will say more about the case for action tomorrow, not least because this particular room is very well versed. Indeed, many of you are on the front line. We're going to hear from Minister Siddiqui from uh, Morocco about the amazing work they are doing. And may I say how proud I am that we were able to pivot overnight from a decade working together on sustainable agriculture and biodiversity including through the UK's renowned Darwin Initiative, to supporting those same communities in the high atlas as they recover from the recent earthquake. For all of us now, we need to recognize that in many cases, protecting and supporting the awesome power of nature can offer the most effective and cost-effective way to multiply solutions to so many of the greatest challenges we face from water security that in turn underpins food security to improving public health, tackling the causes and the impacts of climate change and delivering the peace and prosperity we all want to see. 
And the good news is this shared understanding is reflected in the global mission we took on in Montreal to halt and reverse the loss of biodiversity by 2030, as well as in the commitment made by over 140 countries at COP26 in Glasgow to work in partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities to halt and reverse the loss of forests and land degradation by 2030. All backed by around $20 billion of public, private and philanthropic investment, as well as important commitments from the big multilateral development banks and key private sector players. We must make good on those promises and turn them into real action on the ground and a few weeks ago, we welcomed many of you to London, to the Global Food Security Summit, where alongside our Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary and the President of Somalia, we launched our UK International Development White Paper, setting out our long-term vision for how we can uh, work together. There are copies available. Any member of the British team has got a little card with the uh, logo which gets you to read it. It's 148 pages long. I promise everyone in this room that if you start reading it, you will not be able to put it down. It's a genuine contribution to trying to solve some of these very long-lasting uh, problems. And the white paper also is a contribution to achieving lasting solutions to prevent famine and save lives, build resilient, more sustainable food systems, and supercharge our efforts to get back on track to meeting our 2030 Global Sustainable Development Goals. I'm pleased that the package of new investments and initiatives we announced there included £45 million in new support to CGIAR, taking UK funding to £110 million over the next three years. To help us identify and scale up the funding, we need to develop and deploy innovative solutions as well, including a new UK CGIAR centre on science. From flood-tolerant rice in Bangladesh to disease-resistant wheat in Ethiopia, CGIAR has an unmatched record on the ground. Our investment will include £5 million for the US vision for adapted crops and soils in Africa in partnership with USAID and £5 million for the Crop Trust Endowment Fund to conserve gene banks of seeds varieties that underpin our future food security. We worked in partnership with Somalia and the UAE COP presidency on the Food Security Summit. And I want to congratulate them for championing the Food Systems Transformation Campaign, including Emirates Leaders' Declaration on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems and Climate Action, which we launched on World Leaders' Day with over 130 endorsements. And with thanks to our co-leads, Egypt, and everyone who has fed in, I am delighted to announce that we are launching the Agriculture Breakthrough Priority Action Plan 2024, bringing together 17 countries who are committed to working together to make climate resilient and sustainable agriculture the most attractive and widely adopted option for farmers everywhere by 2030. The plan addresses the recommendations of the independent report published during New York Climate Week in September with expert leadership from CGIAR, for which we are all immensely grateful, alongside FAO's chief scientist and the UN's high-level climate action champions, all calling on governments to lead from the front and to work together. We need everyone on board, so we make sure everyone feels the benefits of accelerating the transition, working alongside the FAO, CGIAR, HESAT 2030, and others to coordinate our investment in game-changing advances that can help us with everything from using less land to developing better, more environmentally friendly fertilizers and cutting methane emissions and making the most of AI. I encourage countries to join the agricultural breakthrough and build further progress through the global agriculture policy dialogue that the UK has convened alongside the World Bank. Through the dialogue, we have brought together 45 countries since 2021. 
to share our experience of policies that work to deliver sustainable agriculture and build new partnerships. And I hope you will all get involved with the just rural transition, bringing even more of us together across sectors and across society. Let's keep at it and turn even great ambition into action, together closing the global finance gap, getting food to people everywhere, and shifting the dial away from destruction and towards sustainability, resilience, and renewal. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for those remarks. They lay the groundwork very nicely for our panel discussion on how existing initiatives can deliver change. And thanks also for flagging the fascinating quality of the breakthrough report. You will not be able to put it down. Now, Morocco has been a steadfast participant in the agricultural breakthrough engagement, as well as in the global agricultural policy dialogue. We're very fortunate to have with us today Morocco's Minister of Agriculture, Maritime Fisheries, Rural Development, and Water and Forests, His Excellency Minister, Professor Dr. Mohamed Siddiqui. Minister Siddiqui, welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like first uh, to thank very much His Excellency uh, Minister uh, Mitchell for his invitation. And I am really d delighted to attend this uh, event uh, on what capacity do we meet, uh, do we have to meet the commitment of implementing the food systems transformation agenda. The last four years context resulting from a historical polycrisis demonstrates once more uh, that our food systems are fragile and vulnerable. But in same time, that gave us, uh, you know, the opportunity that uh, to show and to increase awareness worldwide that without agriculture and food, no nation is uh, safe from insecurity and instability. By officially joining Agricultural Breakthrough Priority International Elections for 2024, Morocco confirms its determination to play a major role to contribute to this global initiative by offering our commitment resources and expertise. Aware of the challenges of climate change, Morocco has taken significant measures to develop resilient and sustainable agriculture by implementing an ambitious agricultural strategy for the period 2030 named Generation Green, committed to promoting sustainable development, ensuring food security and consolidating food sovereignty. Generation Green strategy is based on two major foundations. The first gives priority to human development. The second targets resilient and eco-efficient agriculture. By investing massively in innovative agricultural practices, we target adapted and sustainable agriculture through the creation of added value by innovation in both the diversification of the crop systems and the practices and technologies that allow to make more in terms of production with less in terms of resources, particularly water and soil. To address climate change challenges and their impact on food security and agriculture, international collaboration is vital. In this regard, Morocco launched during the COP22 in uh, 2016, the initiative for the adaptation of the African agriculture to climate change, which is called AAA. That uh, aims to contribute to food security in Africa. It has several international partners, including 35 African countries, the World Bank, CGR, FAO, and the uh, pour Mille initiative. The AAA initiative has enabled seven African countries, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Mali, Morocco, and the Rep Republic of Congo to develop climatic smart investment plans in partnership with the World Bank, the NDC partnership through the BMZ and the French Agency for Development. On the other hand, based on strategic collaboration, Morocco and CGR through ICARDA, are undertaking uh, several initiatives aimed at improving food so sovereignty by first reducing yield gap 
using conservation agriculture, efficient irrigation systems and demonstration platforms. Second, increasing genetic gain through plant breeding by developing new cereal and legumes varieties tolerant to biotic and abiotic stresses. Morocco is planning to intensify and extend its collaboration with all the CGR centers. Morocco is a member of the International Wheat Initiative that focuses on genetics, genomics, physiology, breeding, and agronomy. For ensuring soil conservation, we launched in 2021 a program of 1 million hectares of no-tell system and a practice which will allow better productivity compared to the conventional seeding, especially in the years of drought while improving carbon sequestration in the soil and reducing soil erosion. In addition, our progress in the field of agroforestry is significant. The planting of 100 uh, hectares, 100,000 hectares of, of carob trees and 130,000, 100,000 hectares of cactus, in addition to being a diversification strategy, illustrates our commitment to multifunctional agriculture. At the same time, we are moving towards digital agriculture, taking advantage of the cutting edge technologies to optimize our agricultural practices, to closely monitor crops, adjust agronomic practices in real time, and optimize the use of resources such as water and fertilizers. These converging efforts with the national and international collaborations in genetic improvement, conservation agriculture, agroforestry, and digital agriculture are the pillars of the resilient agriculture in the face of climatic change and market volatilities. I look forward to working with you all, sharing our vision and innovative solutions to shape a future where food security, sustainability, and prosperity are the pillars for a better planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Sadiqi, for sharing some of Morocco's national policy experience on food system transformation, also on that link between national effort and international collaboration. So many thanks indeed, Minister Sadiqi and Minister Mitchell, who needs to leave us now actually for his next engagement, but not before you join me in expressing our appreciation to both ministers for their time. Audience, so far we've heard of a number of key initiatives for advancing the food systems transformation agenda. And we have representatives from those initiatives who will be joining me up here in just a little while on the panel. But you heard that all three of our keynote speakers this morning mentioned this agricultural chapter of the Breakthrough Report. We're lucky to have Dr. Aditi Mukherjee, director of the CGIR Climate Impact Platform, who led the team of us CGIR core authors um, on the Breakthrough Chapter, and um, Dr. Mukherjee Aditi is joining us virtually to share a summary of key findings and recommendations. It's just five minutes, but it's enough to put everybody in the room on the same page for our panel discussion. Aditi, over to you. Hi. Hi, Hi everyone. I'm very, uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you and we see your slides. If you could put them on screen um, yes. slideshow. Wonderful. Please go ahead. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity. Hello, everyone. I see it's a packed room from where I'm sitting. So that's excellent. So I'm going to present very quickly uh, the main highlights of this report. And many of our co-authors are in that room, including Lorraine. So please, uh, during the networking event, make sure you, you talk to them and to know more about the report. Also, we have the QR cards that, that takes you to the report website uh, on each of those seats. So please pick, pick those up. Um, I think this is an audience that already knows why agriculture. So I would just say why agriculture, because it's both a victim of climate change in the sense that the world's poorest depend on this sector for their livelihoods. And it's also a cause of climate change, given that one third of the emission comes from this sector. So it is very obvious that climate action needs to happen in this sector. And it is surprising that it has taken us 27 COPs to, to have this realization. So this is a very obvious one. 
We have already heard about the breakthrough goal, both from the minister and from our uh, executive managing director and the 17 countries who have signed up for this and would be taking the international priority action uh, in 2024. So I won't go into this, but uh, then what exactly is the agriculture breakthrough? To, to uh, walk you down that, there are four principles of agriculture breakthrough. Any technology or approach to for it to qualify as an agriculture breakthrough, it has to do all four preferably, but that often may not happen, but as, as many of these principles have to be met. These are sustainable increases in agricultural productivity and incomes, particularly in low and medium con income country context. A technology or approach must reduce GHG emissions from the agri-food sector. The third is it must result in improved soil, water resources, and natural ecosystems. And the fourth is it must actually lead to improved adaptation and resilience among smallholder farmers. So technologies that meet all four of these uh, or, um, or, or minimizes trade-offs among these will count as an agriculture breakthrough. And the report that uh, we had, we did with our colleagues um, uh, from also FAO and other uh, organizations actually uh, details many of these technologies across seven uh, areas that I'll come to it briefly now. Now, how do you achieve those four uh, principles? So in this report, we say that there are at least five pathways for achieving those breakthrough principles. The first pathway, and there's been a lot of discussion around that, I know, across the COP. First is reduce unsustainable consumption, particularly when that consumption is harmful for both human health and environmental health. Within that, we have examples around reducing fertilizer use in high application areas. We have a section on fertilizers. We have worked on, uh, there's a chapter on promoting alternative protein where animal source protein consumption is unsustainably high with negative health and environmental impacts. Then we have a chapter around reducing food waste and food waste is particularly around unsustainable consumption and the use of digital services. We heard from the Minister of Morocco around this also. Then the second pathway is around increasing production of sustainable, healthy, nutritious food. Here we have talked about appropriate use of fertilizers in areas of underuse. Much of Africa barely uses fertilizers, so there is the chapter talks about both overuse and underuse. Then we have we have a section around crop breeding, which is particularly important because crop breeding improved varieties allow you to increase production without uh, deforestation. And deforestation, to remind you, is one of the leading causes of emissions in our sector. Similarly, as Mahane has already talked about the livestock uh, breeding, and then we also have a chapter around agroecological approaches, which also helps doing the same. Pathway three is around reducing damage to natural resources. So many of these technologies also have those, uh, those core benefits, including efficient use of fertilizers, including low emission fertilizers, natural fertilizers, natural manure, et cetera. Then agroecological approaches, food loss and waste, uh, and all of those are included. Pathway four is around reducing emissions. And here we find that it could be either absolute emission reduction, which is the desirable goal, but in the short term for many technologies, it could also be relative uh, emission reduction. Here we have talked about low emission fertilizers, alternative protein, reducing methane emissions from livestock and food loss and waste. Uh, and then our final pathway is around prioritizing the needs and interests of smallholder farmers. So here we have talked about how can digital services uh, improve climate advisories um, and, and most of those approaches. So but the point here is that these are the pathways and many of the technologies that we discuss actually um, answer to all those several pathways and principles. So these are the seven technologies and this is the um, report I think we do have a few copies of this report should be in the room. Uh, and uh, these are fertilizers, alternative protein, food loss and waste, crop and livestock breeding, uh, reducing methane emissions from livestock, agroecological approaches and digital services. 
so um, uh, there are two things. One, we have the chapter that summarizes the recommendations for international actions, which then became the basis for the priority international actions that there is a printout again on all on kept on the chairs that talks about the priority international actions that the 17 um, government uh, would would take in view of this. The recommendations have been already talked about by Ismahane in her welcome remarks. So we have five buckets of recommendations. These are around climate finance for proven technologies, uh, recommendations around policies, regulations, and innovations. The third bucket is around metrics, indicators, and standard. The fourth bucket is around in, increased investments in research and development and demonstration, while the final in, uh, recommendation is around private sector, markets, and trade. But none of these recommendations are generic in the report because we deep dive into the seven technological areas and approaches. Each of these recommendations are quite concrete. And this is exactly the recommendation bucket that has been now used to develop the international um, action uh, that will be discussed later in this session. So thank you. These were all our um, uh, author groups. So I, I presented on behalf of them. And back to you, Lorraine. Thank you. to invite to the stage our five panel members. If they'll please join me up here. Please grab a seat. And as they make their way up, you will now hear me utter words that don't often come out of my mouth, which is, please pick up your phone. And if you connect through the QR code that is on the screen, we have posted a question for the audience on Slido. As you hear our panelists speak and we lead into a conversation all together, please feel free to send questions or indeed ideas about the issue that we're here to explore together. Are existing initiatives and tools sufficient to advance the COP28 food systems transformation agenda? And if not, then what's missing? Please feel free to put that into Slido as well. And of course, initiatives and tools, we mean products, but also approaches or dynamic mechanisms. I need that chair. Okay, so welcome to you all, and thanks for agreeing to come today. We have microphones. We will share. It's collective action is important. Okay, welcome to you all, and thanks for agreeing to come today and to help us explore this question that's up there. The idea would be for each of you to take two, maybe two and a half minutes to feed into the conversation from your perspective, and then we can open it up and see how far we can get in answering this important question with all the interested people in the room. So I wanted to start by introducing Alison Thompson, who's engaged with the Efficient Fertilizer Consortium. Alison is from the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, FAR, where she's the Ag Mission Scientific Program Director. So, Allison, the Breakthrough Report highlights the huge potential of alternative fertilizers to improve sustainability, but whilst maintaining or even increasing productivity. What further collaboration is needed, let's say, between governments, the private sector, research partners, and farmers to accelerate the adoption of novel fertilizers? And then how can we ensure that the right level of fertilizers are used in very different international contexts? Um. Great question. It's, it's wonderful to see how, how uh, fertilizer is highlighted in these solutions because it is, it's a really challenging one for a number of reasons. As you mentioned, some regions are over-fertilizing and harming the environment. Some regions do not have access to sufficient fertilizer and need that to maintain or increase their productivity. At the same time, uh, the soil nitrogen cycling is incredibly dynamic and complex. So there are a lot of um, interesting alternative and novel uh, enhanced efficiency products out there, biological products that are starting to emerge. You know, the private sector is beginning to identify um, different ways to enhance fertilizer uptake and all these really exciting things are, are starting to emerge. Um, 
but we don't fully yet understand um, how well they work in different contexts. We have very limited studies of them, um, often done just one region or one cropping system. Those studies are done in different ways with different methodologies. So as a scientist, when you come in and try to look across these and see what are the most promising new products for reducing nitrous oxide emissions, you, you can't really determine that right now. So um, at FAR, we have, um, we last year received funding from the US State Department, uh, the UK, through the breakthroughs, made a commitment as well to fund the research here. Um, and we've been able to build now a multi-stakeholder coalition uh, to help address this, this problem of um, creating standard protocols, standard ways to evaluate all these fertilizers um, in different contexts, in different regions of the world, and begin to build the data that we need to be able to promote the different solutions that work in different contexts. Um, I think we have a real opportunity. We have obviously governments, but we have some of the fertilizer companies, the corporate side. We have farmer organizations engaged. We have other philanthropies engaged. Um, and so we're really looking to, to work with the, the Breakthrough Group and others um, to embrace the idea of, of creating and using standard protocols for evaluating all these products. So we can get to that, reach that promise of, of reducing nitrous oxide emissions from fertilizers. Thank you so much. Let's move immediately before I comment on that to the next sort of giant on the emissions from ag stage, which is methane from livestock. So maybe we'll move over to um, no, it's you, Hayden Montgomery. <laughs> Hayden Montgomery is Program Director for Agriculture at the Global Methane Hub. Um, you know, in the Ag Breakthrough Priority Action Plan that <clears throat> followed the report, countries have committed to increased, like a higher level, but also better coordinated investment in, in agriculture R&D. And how is the Global Methane Hub dealing with the challenge that we all face of translating research on livestock methane into action, um, including sort of the different challenges one would find, let's say, in the global north as opposed to the global south. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. And um, first of all, to acknowledge the authors of the report, um, it's a really important piece of work and look forward to doing what we can to aid in its implementation. Um, on the very uh, complex question, um, well, first of all, uh, we need solutions. So the uh, reference to the enteric fermentation R&D accelerator is uh, an effort that we have taken from the Global Methane Hub to use the philanthropic resources that we have to catalyze investment from uh, other foundations, uh, from governments and from the private sector to have what is going to be and already is the largest ever globally coordinated research effort to address the single largest uh, anthropogenic source of methane, which is enteric fermentation and for which we don't have solutions to get reductions uh, globally in line with the goals we've set ourselves, um, particularly given the scenarios of growth and demand and, and, and so on. So we need those solutions to be uh, worked on very hard now so that in the next decade we have them um, ready for use. Um, then of course there are other solutions we know a lot about that just aren't being implemented and there are lots of reasons for that. Um, data is a big problem. Um, and being able to really evaluate the impact of changing practices on emissions. It's very much like Alison said, we, it's, it's tricky, right? These are complex biological systems and um, attribution of, of a management change or a technology to the actual emissions reduction is challenging. So it's really important we work hard to get better, you know, to use the lingo of this process, the MRV, uh, right and work very hard to support countries um, to improve their uh, greenhouse gas inventories, their transparency reports, all of which should underpin improved policy <clears throat> and being able to design policies that actually address um, the, the biggest opportunities within a given uh, country and, and sector. Um, what we are trying to do, uh, you know, we can't do it all, but to contribute to the kind of implementation aspect, um, mm -hmm. we're trying to use our resources in a way that they're intended, which is for, for the public good, you know, for charitable purposes. So we want to work kind of upstream in some degree to develop tools and data that can be used by anybody and have those um, available to anybody and really fill gaps in R&D and, and other activities that aren't being addressed by the private sector um, or governments. Um, so it's kind of trying to address a market failure. 
<clears throat> and then with those tools, um, how do we get the scale of adoption? Um, so one example um, is with development agencies, um, multilateral development banks and others who have extremely large operations um, working with, um, with partner countries, we're really trying to see how the tools we develop can be brought into those operations and scaled. Uh, and very um, pleased to see here announced an initiative with, with EFAD, which is trying to do exactly that. It's mainstreaming the consideration of, um, of methane mitigation in appropriate ways within the design of these operations, whether they be loans or grants or, or various other blended finance. Um, I see that as a huge opportunity, and it's a slight twist on some of the language in this document which talked about making climate finance work for agriculture. I would say right now the biggest opportunity is making agriculture finance work for climate because that's the money that's going out the door today. Right. And I think the climate finance is kind of the next big horizon, but it's going to take some work. So we're, we're devoting energy to that, that, that short-term opportunity um, of, of uh, development in agricultural finance. That's great. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate that both of your comments um, sort of touched on what some of the main obstacles to scaling are, because to a certain extent there are solutions. And so hearing you talk not only about scaling finance, but also about sort of the data needs and, and sort of parameterizing the different technologies, um, you know, sort of acknowledging the complexity and at the same time we can't just throw up our hands, oh, it's so complicated, you know, so um, yeah, I do appreciate that. I want to invite our next panelist, um, Olo Ajayi, who is a Global Program Lead on Food Security and Rural Wellbeing at the Global Center on Adaptation. Thank you for joining um, Olu. In the breakthrough report, we talk about how digital services present a vital tool for successful transformation um, of the agri-food system, mainly underpinning farmer advisory services and data-driven farming approaches. And you provide leadership um, to the mainstreaming of climate adaptation in, in various ways in the design of investment, including the Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. And so how is that initiative accelerating the development and uptake of digital services among smallholder farmers? Thank you very much. Yes, I think the, the concern about, um, just like I've been said earlier on, is the fact that sometimes the solutions exist, but it's not connecting to farmers who need them. So if you put it this way, it's like there is a disconnect or there's a difference between the science of discovery and the science of delivery. A lot of things have been discovered, but the delivery has been quite a challenge. And we can't keep talking of these issues over and over and over. So the Global Center on Adaptation, uh, where I work, um, entered into partnership discussions with the African Development Bank, because we felt that, it was felt that the real big banks, in terms of financing um, agricultural investment in Africa and other parts of the world, is done by the the World Banks of this world, the African Development Banks of this world, the Islamic Development Bank of this world, how do we ensure that these solutions that are existing are mainstream, are connected to this um, investment decisions? So that was, that was the, the basis. So discussing with the head of state and the high level um, decisions in, in Africa and internationally, so this agreement came together to form a partnership, a program which is called Accelerating the Adaptation, African Adaptation Accelerated uh, Program which is basically um, engaging GCA and starting with African Development Bank, forming a partnership where we look at the pipeline of investment projects, look at areas where we can um, get some information about um, some knowledge analytics. First, we said, what are the challenges of the climate change? What is the extent of the climate, um, climate risk? So what are the existing solutions that are available that can help to address these solutions or this problem that have been identified? So on the basis of that, we work with, um, of course, with CG, with um, SEAT, with uh, CMIT and others and say, come on, guys, you have a lot of solutions. Can you help us and identify the, the particular solution that can fit into this, uh, sorry, uh, into this problem that have been identified? So when that's done, we work together with the AFDB operation staff to ensure that in the design of the project, these are mainstreamed and resources are located to them, to those um, digital tools in the project design. And of course, we also do some uh, facilitate some, some training. So far, that has been done, uh, starting first with African Development Bank and GCU, but now that partnership has, has, has expanded. The World Bank has joined that partnership. IFAD has just joined it recently, and we're discussing with um, Islamic Development Bank, where we have projects on the ground. Uh, 
all together we have in agriculture field we have done over um, about 14 15 different projects and to the value of 2.4 billion um, US dollars of the projects within the last two years but overall because it's not just this partnership is not just for agriculture alone it's also for infrastructure it's also on youth development and innovative financing all together it's about 7 billion over the past two years that have been doing together with all this uh, um, financing institutions. So it's something that, that works and it's helping to kind of take out these digital solutions in the implementation of these investment projects over a long term. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Because I'm hearing you say sort of three things, almost like a, a supply chain of innovation, right? You two talked about the disconnect between the science of discovery and the science of delivery. And in between also with this, this latter part of your comments, this identification of problems to innovations whether they come from the local NARS or from CJAR, that matchmaking. So yeah, all three elements are, are important. Thank you, Olu. Um, next, I'd like to turn to our colleague um, and panelist, Kaveh Zahedi from the FAO. Kaveh is Director of the Office of Climate Change, Biodiversity and Environment. The Breakthrough Agenda report highlights the urgent need for more climate finance, which nobody would disagree with, but very specifically, Kaveh, to be targeted towards scaling climate innovation, climate supportive technologies and approaches, right? It's quite specific, the recommendation around that. What can we learn from previous initiatives about how to increase climate finance for scaling science-backed solutions? And what's the role of something like the FAST partnership therein? Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I recognize that we, we've probably been uh, talking to each other over the past 10 days, and, and, and most of us uh, now know the numbers off by heart, right? Uh, Ismahan quoted one of them. Uh, when you look at climate finance overall, only about 4% is going to, to agri-food systems and the solutions that, that they offer in terms of building adaptation, resilience, mitigation, and of course, food security. Um, we, we've had a look, a look at a sort of a slightly narrower lens with the, with, with the climate-tagged ODA, which is important because the climate-tagged ODA is often what triggers much bigger investments to come. And, and even if you look at that narrow window, and that's, that's what the famous 100 billion is, 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 is uh, basically dependent on, um, climate finance going to agri-food system solutions is less than 20% overall. But most worrying of all is that it's on a decline. And don't forget, the analysis recently showed that adaptation funding is also on decline. And it's, it's not, it, the, these are related because so much of adaptation depends on adaptation in, of course, the rural communities, adaptation in agriculture, adaptation in food yeah. systems. So we have a downward trajectory. And of course, what ultimately le you know, reaches the small scale uh, farmers or smallholder farmers is a, is, a, is a subset of even those percentages. So tiny amounts are trickling down to where they need to, to the front line. Uh, in essence. Um, what can we do? Well, I think there, there are ways of turning the tide, and I think the initiatives like the ones we, we, we've been hearing about are super important. From our side, uh, you know, we, we do work with the instruments of this process, of the UNFCCC process, the Green Climate Fund, and the Global Environment Facility. We're helping countries to, to, to access those, those funds. We've helped them access a, a couple of billion dollars worth of those funds, and, and, and those help to trigger much bigger co-investment from the private sector, from the country itself. And increasingly, what we see is these funding instruments are getting much more sophisticated about understanding that agriculture, food systems, the solutions that we offer, many of which are in the breakthrough report, actually are something that can tie together multiple sectoral agendas. So we see a much more holistic approach, and that's exactly what we're promoting. So if you take the Global Environment Facility, the, the food system integrated program. It is truly integrated. It's not just about biodiversity or climate or food. It's about all of them at the same time. And that enables us to go in with the kind of investments that are needed, agroforestry or soil regeneration, things that can deliver on food, they can deliver on climate, adaptation, mitigation. Um, and, and I think that's a good direction, the same direction we see in the Green Climate Fund in the portfolio that we are certainly helping. FAST is just a way of bringing it all together and making sure that uh, what happens at these COPs is not what my director general called a firework. You know, it sort of goes up and then that's it and you forget about it and you move on. Uh, but it sort of ties the COPs together and gives us a baseline. So we get together and say, okay, this, you know, we have the breakthrough, we have the solutions, we understand what they are, how much money is going towards them, not enough. 
we get back together next time and say, did we do better? How can we do better, right? And we sort of connect the cops when it comes to investments in agri-food systems. Well, and keep the momentum going. Thank you very much for that. Um, audience, I just want to remind you to continue to feed your ideas in as we move to our last um, panelist, Melissa. Melissa Pinfield is Senior Fellow at the Meridian Institute, where she's a Senior Advisor to VCMI and to the initiative known as the Just Rural Transition. Melissa, you've listened to the others speak about how um, sort of different formats and different forms of international collaboration help or can help to deliver agri-food transformation, including our, our opening keynote speeches. How can we ensure, though, that we do this in a way that enhances resilient livelihoods and ensures an equitable transformation? Uh, thanks so much uh, for the question. It's great to be here. Um, I think what's really been exciting, you know, I mean, reading through this um, agricultural breakthrough report um, and being here at COP and, you know, the, the Emirates declarations have been launched on that first day as well. There's this really growing convergence around the what, like, you know, what is it, what are some of the main pieces of work that we really need to be focusing on, some of the actions that we need to take. But I want to really focus my sort of comments on on the how we move forward with this with this transition. And I think that's, you know, there also seems to be growing recognition that that is also just equally important. So the Just Rule transition was established three years ago as a knowledge hub, um, as a multi-stakeholder platform, um, and as a, gr a growing community of practice of people who are really looking to promote these sort of inclusive and social and just transitions for sustainable, resilient agriculture and food systems. So a couple of things I think are really relevant. I and mean, when you're looking to take through an agenda like this, which really does you know, look to be getting to that sort of systems level change, is the opportunity to ad apply a just transition lens um, to strategies and plans. So just transition is you know, fairly widely understood in the energy context, but as we know, food and agriculture is, is far more complex. Um, and so the just rule transition worked with the community around um, developing a set of 10 principles to, to really act as a kind of a guide and a prompt to policymakers and others who are looking forward to kind of move forward with some of this um, uh, this reform process in response to the climate and nature uh, crises. So what do we mean by just transition in a just food systems transition? I won't read you the 10 um, principles, but just to sum up, it means meaningfully engaging diverse stakeholders in, in that sort of visioning and, and, and imagining that what the, the future rights, particularly those who are affected by the decisions. Um, it also means um, fairly managing the distributional impacts of change so that the costs and risks are not concentrated on certain groups and that hardship doesn't result from the transition. And it also just means the benefits of change should be more widely shared rather than concentrated. And then finally, it's about using that transition as an opportunity to address some of the existing injustices and inequalities. And the second thing that I really think is relevant to this agenda, because we're talking a lot about knowledge and innovation in, in driving this agenda, is, is there's, there's huge value in traditional and local knowledge as well, alongside scientific evidence. And I think what's really exciting is when you start to see that being combined. So, you know, traditional knowledge, for example, uh, you know, we're really... Uh, indigenous peoples protect 80% of global biodiversity. And so there's a huge amount, I think there's a huge willingness on their part to sort of really start to demonstrate the value that that is holding as well and learning from that. And also combining, you know, ensuring that they also have, are equipped with some of these tools and innovations as well that will enable them to better protect um, the, 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 the areas where they live which are really holding so much of that value of biodiversity. Similarly, local farmers, you know, they're not waiting for these solutions to come to them. They're already developing and adapting and innovating because they have to. It's an existential crisis for them. So they're often asking, you know, scientists from universities to come and, and, and see and validate, you know, some of what they're already working on. So I think, you know, really looking for those opportunities to collaborate with farmers, um, to, to learn and understand and listen to some of the solutions that they're already coming up with um, and and then, and I think really also building trust through these sorts of multi-stakeholder collaboration processes, that's, that trust is going to be absolutely essential so that, you know, farmers learn better from each other. You know, they'll often, you know, so we're looking for the uptake of tools and technologies as well. So I'll leave it there, but I'm, I'm really excited to see there's a growing focus on these issues as well.
Yeah, I mean, definitely a growing focus and a growing interest. I was just scrolling through the Slido responses um, while you were speaking, and a lot of them have to do with serious engagement with farmers and serious consideration of how these new technologies um, will impact different groups differently. So um, I think what I'd like to do, I'm just keeping an eye on time, is to just maybe ask our panelists to give one, one line on what more you think needs to be done to address the recommendations of the Breakthrough Agenda report? If you had a magic wand and had to say one thing and got cut off otherwise, not that that would happen, of course. But if you did have that opportunity, what is it that you would, that you would say? Um, let's see, one sentence. Data, um, and not just standardizing collection of data, but being willing to share the information, the results, and the underlying data so that over time we can really build the evidence case for what's going to work. Thank you, lots of clauses, but still one sentence is good. Thank you very much. Uh, these technologies exist, but they work differently, they perform differently in different places. So I think we need an evidence-based categorization of this um, technologies in terms of their potential adoptability into high level, medium level, and low level. So we can guide the scaling up efforts of this adoption of these uh, technologies. Thanks. Yeah, um, so, you know, as we're sitting in COP, I, I think we, we, we do have to sort of acknowledge the fact that uh, while we're talking about breakthroughs, there wasn't a breakthrough on this agenda yes. Uh, yes. on the other side of, 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 of the big campus. So, so you know, uh, I think that somehow we have to find a way to, to bring together this constellation of initiatives that, that exist out there, funding sources, ama amazing initiatives that, that, are, uh, that, are, that are springing up all over the place, to, to bring some sort of coherence and rally it to, to, to some degree behind the declaration that, that happened earlier in this week. So really, it is about coming together a little bit more, sharing a little bit more, working with and through each other a little bit more, and, and hopefully uh, you'll hear a little bit more about all of this uh, tomorrow on, in terms of the, the declaration and its implementation, and I hope that will give us our, our rallying cry. And I, and I do note that Martin from the World Bank is in here, and we're, we're partners in crime in this, in this endeavor. So I would double down on the data, um, and I would, as I promised to, I would mention another source of methane that isn't very explicit in this report, and that is rice. And I think we need to apply attention to that because um, it's a huge source in some countries, and it's growing in some regions. And if we're if we're serious about methane, we need to we need to pay attention to that. And I think it needs innovation. Uh, there's you know AWD, great, but we need innovations and breakthroughs and think of new approaches that will work with farmers. Okay, rice and data. Melissa. Dialogue and inclusive processes that build trust because we can have all the innovations that we like, but if we are heading into this as a politically contested space, which it can be, and divisive, we're not going to be able to move forward. We need to build trust. Yeah, thank you very much. Just a round of applause for the effort of the panelists to stay where you are. We're going to turn it over to the audience. There are people who have stood through it all until now, so I just want to make sure, and in fact, we have the full amount of time allocated to question and answer. I don't know if somebody's going to help me with the microphone, um, but let's start collecting some questions. Yes, sir. Um, Yes, a question. My name is Henk Holtzlag from the Meta Meta Smart Center Group. I have a question to the gentleman of FAO. Um, would you agree with the proposition that probably the most cost-effective action to, re to increase food production would be sharing knowledge and, and south-south exchange of best practices, so demonstrating and training? And we have one example. Uh, the FAO published a, a, a something on heart pen, a problem of heart pen, which is a problem which occurs in many countries. It, you know, it affects the percolation of rainwater. And in Malawi, they are tackling this problem by uh, breaking the hard pen, mixing it with compost, and they double the food production. So what, what can FAO do to, to, to help to exchange this, this type of best practices? Thank you.
Hello. Um, my question is about the standards framework. You say that we need to adapt the standards framework for the agriculture. So the question is with which standards are working today and if it is possible to join this coalition. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much for that. I, I think, you know, as we look at the, this, this, this breakthrough report, which is really an excellent report, we do have to remind ourselves it's not all about high tech. It, it is about technology, but that technology might be as simple as, you know, the drought resistant seeds. It might, might be as simple as transferring what is working in a country with the conditions that another country might be facing tomorrow, right? Uh, and, and, and so you're absolutely right, is getting that knowledge quickly across. But the problem right now is that we just don't have time, right? We, ha we don't have time to learn and relearn. We have to exchange uh, quickly. So, so we, we, we try to do that through our farmer field schools, for example, very quickly get that kind of knowledge into, into the community. And those farmer field schools are an integral part of all of these big money initiatives that we talk about from the Global Environment Facility, the integrated program, food systems, etc. Ultimately, it's all about making that, that knowledge reach where, where it needs to. So, so thank you. If it's the most cost effective, probably it's, it's a good investment, isn't it? Investing in our farmers uh, brings a lot of dividends when it comes to climate change. Thank you. I can talk a little about data standards for a minute. So when it comes to testing novel and alternative fertilizers, we are developing those protocols and we welcome others to help us in developing them and adopting them and using them in research more broadly across scientific you know, endeavors in climate smart agriculture and whatnot. There, there are um, there are protocols, there are standards that different organizations have developed. I would say the key thing to be paying attention to is for research data to be made fair, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So any standards that are meeting those that fair standard and making that data accessible um, and interoperable and out there in the community are what's going to really help add to our collective knowledge. Thank you. Okay. There was one question coming in on the Slido, um, uh, Hayden, about sort of what a comprehensive or a holistic, I should say, I think they've used the word holistic, policy framework would look like um, for methane, sorry, that another thing popped up while I was speaking, so methane reduction strategies that are there, there are no silver bullets, but are there success stories on the policy front that you want to share with the group? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think for um, the, the sort of short-term opportunity relating to um, wider adoption of existing practices, I wouldn't necessarily consider that a methane policy is required. You know, it's more getting the incentives right that have led to the adoption of those practices already in some places, um, and removing distortions and and things in the system which could relate to public support not being channeled correctly to deliver these sorts of outcomes. Um, market access and various other things that, you know, send signals to farmers. Um, and I think having that correct would mean that, you know, yields and productivity are likely to improve because it has done that in, the, in other places. And that gets us a certain degree of the way and then that, that would be when uh, a stronger signal on methane would be required, I think, and that's to sink the lid, right? And that's to drive the innovation. And there you have pricing mechanisms, trading mechanisms, etc. cetera. Um, on the issue of pricing and trading with respect to agricultural methane, I can't point to too many success stories, to be quite honest. It's something I think the governments are grappling with. There have been lots of, well, some attempts over some period of time to try and develop um, price-based mechanisms of varying sorts to address agricultural emissions, and it's proving challenging. And I think it's proving challenging for a number of reasons. One is it's just challenging to measure and to have that kind of um, signal at the farm level because it's just a lot of data. And the other is, I think, um, a reluctance of having first movers when they could be at competitive disadvantages. So we have to find a way. Yeah. Um, to have everyone move kind of together, I think. Um, and if that can be supported by other sources of finance to soften the blow, and if we can have a big effort on data to get clarity on what's actually, you know, going to lead to reductions that may not come at a cost to the farmer, I think that's going to help. But I wouldn't say there are too many success stories just yet. Okay. 
Yeah, that in itself is an answer. But as you said, you know, we collectively need to move towards them. Um, Melissa Nolu, I do not have a question for you. I have a lot of resonance for the things that you said about scaling with farmers and around the just transition, which I think is probably a good segue to our um, concluding speakers. But first, I'd like us to just share an appreciation for the panel and also for your questions. Thank you so much. You guys can return, and I will. Oh, is this working now? Can you hear me clearly? All right, we are very lucky to have, just transitioning from that question on just transition. Um, yeah, I said that twice, but I meant two different things. We have the CEO for the National Smallholder Farmers Association of Malawi here to speak to us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Betty Chinyamiamu and uh, to speak to us about how existing initiatives and tools are impacting smallholders. And following you, we're going to have the Global Director from the World Bank on Agriculture uh, to speak to us because these are the building blocks. Welcome, Betty. Um, thank you very much, uh, Lorraine, and, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, just as I've been introduced, I am coming from Malawi, uh, from the National Smallholder Farmers Association of Malawi, but I'm also, we are a member of the World Farmers Organization, so um, uh, the, the issues that I will discuss here relate not only to farmers uh, from Malawi specifically, but they are, even though there's diversity amongst the membership and the WFO, uh, but there are still issues that... Um, cut across uh, farmers uh, from the different regions. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say that um, international collaboration is very important because uh, many times we have seen that uh, multiple and coordinated approaches confuse the farmer. In fact, uh, we are in a stage where every year we are having to learn of new terminologies, new technologies, and all those things. And when you talk to the farmer, the farmer gets confused. And they'll ask you, what is wrong with the other one? What happened? And it's like, it's a life that's con constantly changing. So when we're talking of international collaboration, working together on some of in these initiatives and approaches, it is very important because it will address that uh, very issue of confusing the farmer. Secondly, I'd like to say that uh, as we do that, it's very important to make sure that the farmer is involved. Uh, not only because uh, that is the right thing to do or that those approaches and initiatives impact the farmer, but more importantly, because there's something that the farmer can give. The farmer has knowledge, the farmer has experience, the farmer has expertise that would enrich whatever approaches, initiatives, innovations that we could be bringing to them. So it's very, very important that we engage with them. As farmers, and smallholder farmers in particular, we say that we'd like to be at the dinner table. Not as the menu, but actually as part of the diners choosing the menu. Because most of the time, Farmers are the menu at the dinner table, the subject of discussion. Everybody is looking at the menu and making choices, and the farmer is not there. So we are saying that when the farmer is involved in a real manner, not only in implementation, but right from the design, the design of all those initiatives, design of all those approaches, all the way to implementation, and even monitoring, then we actually enrich the farmer, the actual um, involvement of the farmer that we talk, we talk about gets done. Because there are many times when we talk about engaging the farmer, when actually what we've done is actually not engaging them. But we need to engage them in a manner that is meaningful, in a manner that would really um, have the views and perspectives of the farmer heard and included in our, um, in our approaches. 
for most farmers, there's too much at stake. In as far as adopting new approaches or adopting new uh, technologies is involved. And because of that, the farmers really want to be sure that uh, we're in this together and that the approach that we are working with them is actually something that we are going to work with them the whole way. In other words, that we will not dump them or will not leave them when things don't go on well. The last point that I would like to say is that uh, many times, and, and it is very encouraging to hear you know, different partners talking about international collaboration, coming together, coming up with strategies um, as multiple organizations. But many times um, that collaboration seems to focus only on the softer, straightforward issues. Things like sharing reports, sharing best practices, but when it actually comes to joint implementation, joint planning, you find that there are gaps. So our core is to ensure that international collaboration is beyond just sharing reports. International col collaboration for the benefit of the farmer needs to be collaboration that is willing to address the hard issues. The hard issues of how do we get different organizations with different uh, interests at HQ level to actually sit and plan together, implement together, and also monitor together. So, as I conclude, that just one word, that please, we would like to be at the dinner table. And this opportunity, thank you very much that this discussion didn't end without including the voice of the farmer. Thank you. Thank you, Betty, for saying everything you said. <laughs> we appreciate it. I'd like to conclude this today's session by inviting Martin Van Nuykoop, Global Director for the Agriculture and Food Global Practice from the World Bank, to speak to us on that process of convening policy dialogue and mobilizing action, finance for sustainable food system transitions. So Martin, take us home. Well, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Lorraine, and very pleased uh, to be here at this uh, event from commitment to action, how can existing initiatives and tools help advance, I mean, COP28 food systems transformation? Um, you know, I think, I think you need patience. Uh, I think we spoke about the agriculture br breakthrough, uh, and actually that was launched in the COP26. Uh, the Just Rural Transition was discussed, it was also launched a few years ago. Um, I think the Minister Mitchell was mentioning to the global policy dialogues uh, that uh, we, the bank has been doing uh, in 45 countries since uh, 2021. And I think all those initiatives, I mean, somehow contributed uh, and were instrumental, I think, I mean, to the um, mainstreaming agriculture and food at the COP28, I mean, through the uh, endorsement of the declaration on uh, sustainable agriculture, resilient agri-food systems, and climate action. Um, you know, it was 134 countries last week, but I just spoke to the presidency before I came here, and they actually confirmed that now actually we are close, to, we are now at 150 countries. And I think this declaration provides a very important momentum on the uh, agriculture food system transformation uh, journey. Uh, I think this is a very important moment, uh, agriculture and food, uh, at least in the public, uh, you know, narrative um, is, is, is on the main state now. Uh, the World Bank uh, is very committed, I mean, to the agriculture and food systems uh, transformation agenda. Um, I think tomorrow there will be discussion about the launch of a um, technical cooperation uh, um, collaborative uh, that will be put in place, I mean, to assist all those countries, I mean, to uh, start implementing this, uh, this declaration. And it's quite a coalition, eh? because uh, EU, China, US, uh, Nigeria, Brazil, Indonesia, I mean, some of the big countries actually have signed off and endorsed this, uh, this declaration. Um, but CAVE was, you know, uh, very clear. I mean, uh, in the public narrative and all the side events, we're very enthusiastic of what's happening and where things are going. 
But then if you sit in a room with the negotiators and, uh, and FAO is an observer and uh, the World Bank is an observer, and actually that's quite depressing. Uh, actually there was no progress. Um, so we're also discussing um, FAO, uh, IFAD and CJR uh, and the bank, I mean, to kind of launch also a kind of a technical assistance initiative actually to kind of assist the work program of the negotiator so that the, that the declaration can be used as a kind of a reference to inform the work program, I mean, of the, of the negotiators. We think actually that's, that, that, that's very, very important. Um, um, also, um, I want to mention uh, the bank's commitment to the agriculture transformation uh, uh, agenda. Uh, we organized in, uh, in, in Lusaka, May 1st, uh, an, agri an agriculture policy Africa leaders dialogue. Uh, that actually, it was in Lusaka, uh, June 1st. It actually brought together, I mean, quite a few uh, heads of state, um, uh, ministers of finance, ministers of agriculture, to actually discuss agriculture policy, public support to agriculture, and actually shift, I mean, the incentives so that farmers in the private sector have the incentive to invest in climate smart agriculture and in uh, greening supply chains. And at that point, I mean, the bank put its commitment on the table that any country that actually wants to start implementing the agri-food agri systems transformation agenda can, and if it wants to have bank support for it, we are ready actually to provide it to a program for results as one of our lending instruments. Um, and right now, I'm, I'm actually very pleased. I mean, uh, we see actually those program for results, I mean, emerging in our portfolio, uh, a major one which actually happened after the dialogue in Lusaka was in Tanzania, uh, where we launched a, uh, together with the government of Tanzania, $300 million uh, agriculture transformation uh, program. Uh, we also have a half a billion dollar uh, P4R in Bangladesh, and which Lorraine knows very well. But I mean, I see this emerge, and we actually are very committed to that. Um, and, and that will help change the incentives. Uh, but at the same time, what we heard today here as well is that innovation is, is critical, particularly considering that uh, agriculture is already in, unchart in uncharted territory when you look at the effects of, uh, of climate change. Uh, so we are putting also our weight and muscle, whatever you want to call it, I mean, behind the, um, what can be done to accelerate uh, agriculture innovation uh, in our dialogue very, very important. Uh, what we see is that governments only, you, only invest about 0.3, of agriculture GDP in agri-research innovation. Our benchmark is 1%. Uh, so we try to push, I mean, uh, the governments actually to scale up, I mean, the public support for agri-research innovation. But at the same time, we also putting our, we also putting our own money where our mouth is, uh, as also reflected last week uh, when our, um, Vice President for Sustainable uh, Development, Jürgen Vogler, actually announced an additional $100 million that the bank will provide, I mean, to the CJR in 2024 and in 2025, I mean, to the accelerated impacts of CJR climate research for Africa project, the ICRA project, as we, uh, as we say it. Um, and finally, another example of um, the bank's support uh, to the agriculture um, transformation agenda has to do, and you might have heard, our president was here last week. Also, we recently had the, um, our annual meetings in, in Marrakesh. Uh, but, you know, the bank is working on an evolution roadmap to actually scale up the support, I mean, to global public goods um, and particularly climate. And a part of that evolution roadmap is the preparation of a number of what we call global challenge program. And the World Bank right now is preparing six of those programs. One of, ex one of them actually is on food and nutrition security. And the idea of this program actually is to bring financing at scale, I mean, to the food systems transformation agenda. So what you're looking at is how can we bring together, I mean, the public support, domestic resources, the climate financing, the private sector financing by putting in place and shifting towards de-risking um, uh, our financing. And the other thing also, and what can be done, I mean, to actually stimulate uh, and provide incentives for better co-financing. The median size of ODA to agriculture is half a million uh, dollars. Now, final thought, uh, like you also asked in the panel, um, very much, uh, in order to be successful, agriculture transformation, the agriculture transformation agenda really needs to support, I mean, the bottom line of the 
smallholder farmers. I mean, the farmers need to be on board. If the farmers are not on board, uh, you see what happens in my own country. I'm from the Netherlands. I think everybody has read, I mean, the farmers' protest that actually had huge political repercussions as well. In India, we saw two years ago major protests when the government of India tried to kind of put in place, I mean, so, so, some, refor uh, some reforms. So what we th think needs to happen uh, as part of the food systems transformation agenda, we need to change the notion of what it means to be a successful farmer in the 21st century. I mean, we know farmers are producers of food, but I think we need to expand that. I mean, farmers are also providers of ecosystem services, and that actually needs to generate a revenue stream. Uh, and farmers can also be generators of renewable energy, and that actually can provide an additional revenue stream. So as part of the food systems transformation agenda and bringing farmers into the fold, we can say, look, in the end, you're not going to have one um, revenue stream, food, but you're actually going to have three revenue stream, food, ecosystem services, and probably re renewable energy. I think when we achieve that, I think then we can, looking, we can be looking forward, I mean, to a very successful end of the agriculture transformation journey. Thank you very much. Back to Lorraine. Okay, well, just thank you everyone for joining. That is the end of our time together. Many thanks for your participation.